This is the Person of Interest podcast, where we meet extraordinary people with a story to tell. Well, welcome back to the Stockholm School of Economics here in Riga. And I can say again, sunny Riga. We've taken a little bit of a sabbatical at the end of the first season a few months ago for uh, reasons which have probably not escaped anyone who's been watching the world news media. But we're back again, and I'm delighted to say that uh, season two, or series two, um, I have an excellent guest uh, who's agreed to uh, be first out of the traps, Jeffrey Sommers. Welcome, Jeffrey. Mike, glad to be here. And I want to stress at the beginning that it's Jeffrey with a J and two Fs, um, because I know some Jeffreys get very, very angry if you get the wrong Jeff. Is this something that you might I trigger more, you? I have more important things to get angry about. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey is. But that is correct. Jeffrey is associate professor at the university. Full of- professor. I beg your pardon, you need to update uh, certain websites, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and visiting faculty still at SSE Riga? Uh, ask Anders, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a while since I've taught a course. Uh, his, his range of uh, research on economic and social topics is uh, quite mind-boggling, and part of the problem we'll have today is probably not overstretching ourselves, though given that the the title is The Changing Shape of the U.S. Economy and Society, we're almost certain to um, overstretch ourselves in half an hour. Um, But your research areas have included the Baltic states, um, austerity policies, Africa and its diaspora communities, uh, development, and U.S.-Haitian relationships in the 19th and 20th centuries, Uh which I have earmarked for a future podcast already, because I think that sounds really fascinating. Uh, Jeffrey has advised the U.S. State Department, uh, helping train Baltic ambassadors. He's been an advisor to Latvian prime ministers and written for Financial Times, Guardian, New York Times, and sundry other publications, which uh, people such as myself can only dream of appearing in. So welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you. After that rather long introduction. Um, I always begin with the same question, Mm -hmm. which I've partially answered, but I'd like you to go into a bit more depth about what exactly is your connection to SSE Riga? Yeah, I came here on a Fulbright uh, for the first time, so this was roughly 20 years ago, but I've been coming to Latvia for some 25 years and uh, began organizing events here. In fact, I uh, brought a, one of the really great political economists of the uh, 20th century, uh, André Gunderfrank, to SSE Riga. We had a fantastic event, and we followed that up with uh, other high-profile events over the years, people like Emanuel Wallerstein and... Uh, historical sociologists, political economists. So we've had a, um, a run of uh, very successful events, which I think have helped to spur needed dialogue here regarding economic and social and political policy. So was there sort of a void in the kind of post-Soviet space for yeah, this sort of... Yeah, ec- I, I think definitely so. So, you know, the 1990s, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, neoliberalism was ascendant, and it became kind of a, a dominant discourse. Uh, it really wasn't questioned at all. So there was just this kind of a flip. So as they used to say, you know, during the Soviet period, people had to learn to speak Bolshevik. There was a kind of a discourse that you had to be practiced in if you wanted to be taken seriously. And the same thing kind of existed uh, in the 1990s with uh, a kind of a Milton Friedman type uh, 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 discourse on economic policy that you had to you know, speak in, in that uh, mm. uh, uh, language in order to have any kind of meaningful uh, dialogue with policymakers, other academics, etc. So I wanted to uh, challenge that kind of dominant paradigm with uh, the introduction of some different ideas. And in fact, uh, the Stockholm School has produced some notable uh, heterodox thinkers over the years, people like Gunnar Myrdal, uh, who very much challenged dominant economic uh, thinking and paradigms in the uh, mid-20th century. So I wanted to uh, look back to the past in that sense, in terms of that tradition. Well, I mean, uh, I noticed that you, you're you know, a pretty stern critic of what you call neoliberalism. Um, yeah, but definitely have could you just uh-huh. define for us, for, for laymen and so on, mm-hmm. what exactly you mean by neoliberalism? What are the characteristics which you yeah. feel you know, are, are accepted truisms which aren't actually true. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, essentially it was a a mid-20th century project which was realized in terms of policy uh, dominance by the late 20th century. And it uh, arose from a series of concerns that certain economists had, again, in the mid-20th century regarding state development models and the impact that this might have just in terms of uh, freedom, generally, and of the future of market economies. 
And so looking back to the late 19th century, uh, where we had uh, a kind of a liberal economic order for a fairly short period of time, but uh, one which uh, saw relatively high rates of economic growth, etc., but eventually imploded. These thinkers thought that we needed a return to that kind of that period of uh, the Belle Epoque and this uh, really robust economic growth predicated on the free exchange of capital uh, and, uh, and people, uh, really, uh, but that the state would actually have to be used in order to create the conditions for that kind of a market uh, to, to operate, that it would not be something that could be done just through the normal operations of the market. And so by the time we arrive at the 1990s with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc, uh, and the United States doing quite well in the 1980s, it, it was thought that you know, this is a project that really needs to be adopted and implemented uh, in the former Soviet bloc. So that's what we uh, that's what we saw, and that's what we're still dealing with in terms. So, of so was the it then that the you know because let, let's say the West had won the Cold War as it was as it, mm-hmm. as, it, as it were, then the economic model or the economic conditions which happened to be there at the time it was assumed that well they must be right or they must be perfect. Oh, absolutely, or, you know. and and it um, you know was something that one should not even question if one did so. It suggested that uh, there was misplaced loyalties or, mm. you know, perhaps that uh, it, 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 one was looking for a throwback uh, to the Soviet period. So people were really dealing in terms of conceptions of the world in this uh, kind of binary fashion. You know, everything was either or, you know, there, there weren't other possibilities. Uh, I would say that in looking back at the United States, it's kind of interesting because many of the uh, people from the Soviet bloc that actually visited the former Soviet Union and its bloc, in the 1980s, I mean, what they were still seeing were the last vestigial elements of um, FDR's New Deal mm. uh, America. And that was the United States that, you know, was fairly successful. I mean, it had some problems, of course, but nonetheless, it uh, created a broad-based uh, prosperity. So that was the model that was in place. But the guy who was, of course, in charge of the country was Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And he was trafficking in a very different language. So there was that conflation between the language that was being used and what people saw in terms of this broad-based prosperity. So they assumed that the language that Reagan was using in terms of describing uh, how economy should function, you know, kind of a Thatcherite mm. sort uh, of language as well. Sort of yeah, yeah, yeah supply-side kind of, of uh, yeah. uh, 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 a formulation for how economies uh, should function is what delivered this prosperity that they were seeing on the ground in the United States. I mean, you know, arguably one could make the case that what we see in the United States today is a consequence Mm. of those Reagan era uh, policies, uh, rather than what people were seeing in the 1980s. So that's very interesting. So so effectively, you know, the United States economy then was kind of a hybrid and it was going through the transition. But as you say, it was it still had the sort of FDR slight central control sort of uh, aspect to it. Yeah. But the rhetoric was that this is all laissez-faire, exactly. open market capitalism, and right. you can thank us for it. Whereas really what Reagan was doing was kind of predicting his desired future rather than right. commenting on the past. Uh, precisely. I mean, that's exactly what we saw. And that confusion, I think, even reigns to a certain extent today in terms of uh, people's views of the 1980s. So, mm-hmm. And so, well, I mean, it would be fascinating to just stay on discussing this for the next half hour, but we'd better get into this idea of the changing shape of the, the U.S. Sure. economy and society. Uh, I'm, I'm already saying I'm definitely going to have you back for another podcast, so I'm afraid uh, you're going to have to book that into your diary. Yeah, very good. Um, give us a little bit of a, an, an overview again for the layman, because even though you know the U.S. is completely dominant in terms of, well, we know that it's dominant or fairly dominant economically, maybe not quite as much as it was, maybe as much as it was, mm-hmm. but in, certainly in terms of news flow and what people, the news that people receive, mm-hmm. particularly now where we have a presidential you know, election looming and so on. And yet I think probably most people, myself included, don't really have a very good idea of uh, the economic makeup of the U.S., maybe a vague idea that there's been decline in places like Detroit with car building, that we have Silicon Valley has risen, but we don't really know if that's you know, something which is underpinning the whole economy, or is it mm-hmm. just a few, you know, geeky millionaires or, right. or what? So, sort of... Those are the poor people, the millionaires. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Um, 
I, I like it particularly just as a side note. In, 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 in Latvia, often when you get news reporting, someone's profession will still be reported as millionaire. So it'll mm -hmm. be millionaire businessman, blah, 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 rather than just businessman. But that's a side point. It's not that impressive anymore. Yeah. Um, but just give us a brief mm -hmm. overview of what's happened, say, in the last 50 years since you know, the 70s. Um, yeah. Because as you, if we're coming off the back of FDR's New Deal, we've gone to something, it seems, very, very different to that right now. Right. Yeah, there's been a, just a, a complete transformation of the country, really, in the last half century. It's really dramatic just how big the uh, shifts are. So in the 19... Yeah, say let's just look at 1970. So 50 years ago, we saw a country that uh, had a, a minimum wage. A few adjusted it for both inflation and productivity growth, say, up to today. It would be about 21 or $22 an hour. You know, today it's seven twenty-five an hour. Uh, we had about, and I'm not going to rattle off too many numbers here, mm. but about 53% of GDP went to income. Uh, today, that's about 41 or 42%. So that means that much more of the country's output is just going to wealth. In other words, you know, people who um, own things and that are collecting rents from that. So we saw this uh, sh a significant uh, shift in terms of the, the balance of the economy from production to ways of uh, collecting rents. I mean, I think I would put it um, you know, starkly in, in those terms. So what happens in the 1970s is that there's this big economic uh, crisis. Uh, essentially, commodity prices get very high. Oil, but not just oil, food, metals, everything else. And so uh, this really kills profits in uh, uh, the U.S. corporate sector in the 1970s. And at the same time, you know, wages, there was still this upward pressure on wages because the entire post-World War II order was built on an increasing standard of living for workers. They were sharing in the productivity gains that were being created in the post-World War II uh, 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 era in the, in the Bretton Woods period. Same thing in West Europe, uh, not to mention Japan and, and a few other places. And so uh, this resulted in a... Uh, uh, both a crisis of profitability, but also a lack of investment in research and uh, uh, development. And so it was thought that the U.S. risked slipping or declining uh, as a consequence of this new environment in which it found itself in. And so a, a decision had to be made. I mean, what was going to be done uh, about this? Uh, so uh, there were these supply-side economic ideas at the time that were being advanced by people like Milton Friedman and others. And they said that the solution to this is actually not all that hard. What we need to do is to uh, shift more wealth to capital, uh, because if you've got a lot of money, you're not going to spend it all. You can't, you know, unless uh, you're a narcissist. I want to talk about <laughs> one that we all know of. Uh, you can find endless ways of actually spending money, but typically you invest it. Uh, if you have this excess capital. Whereas if you give it to labor, uh, they're going to spend it on things. And if you're in an environment at that time, which was marked by loss of inflation, you didn't actually want more spending uh, because that was part of the problem. Mm. So he wanted to shift of this balance so that uh, people with money had more money. That meant uh, labor had to have a bit less. And it was thought that this would result, again, in this new period of innovation of being created, which would create the productivity gains, which would launch a new round of uh, economic growth and prosperity. So we'll get like new Edisons, new Fords will come Precisely, forward. Precisely, hmm. yeah. But, but what happened, I think, uh, as the evidence shows over the past 50 years, is that that research really did not take place. And you know, we can look at research expenditures uh, over the, the past 50 years. And rather than increasing, they actually declined. And what research uh, spending was left uh, was really being done by the public sector for the most part through uh, science grants that were going to our, our uh, public and private uh, universities. So private companies, instead of uh, you know, having these new Bell Labs, which in the you know, uh, um, early and uh, middle part of the 20th century uh, saw this incredible explosion of innovation taking place in terms of research and introducing all sorts of new products, uh, companies did not want to spend that money anymore on that because the, the returns were too distant in the future. And you had a shareholder revolution in the 1970s in which people wanted you know, higher returns every quarter on their invested capital. They didn't want to wait for years and years for uh, investments to uh, uh, pay off. And so they offloaded or they externalized 
those research costs to uh, the state sector. So what happened with all this money that was shifted upward? Well, uh, it, it largely went to the financial sector. So we saw what we often uh, uh, um, hear, you know, the term financialization. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, uh, economy was financialized. So then we get the rise of Wall Street, you know, Really in the eighties, and... right, right, and by the time we get to two thousand and seven, right before the uh, you know big two thousand and eight economic shock, uh, just to back up a little bit, I mean what we've seen since this period of financial financialization was introduced in the nineteen seventies was that all of a sudden a very unstable economy was created. If you take a look at the U.S. economy in the post World War II period, say from nineteen forty five up through the mid nineteen seventies. There really were not any major, I mean, there were recessions, but there were not financial collapses mm -hmm. uh, to speak of. After this new supply side model was introduced, the financial crashes uh, emerged and they started coming more regularly and they were bigger with each subsequent uh, shock. So we begin with the Franklin Bank crisis of 1974 and then we see uh, the SNL crisis and several more. But by the time we get to 2007, uh, as a percentage of all corporate profits, uh, finance was consuming nearly 50%. I mean, this is incredible. I mean, you know, what does the financial sector uh, do that could possibly warrant mm. consuming nearly half of the corporate profits in the country? Well, of course, the answer is uh, it can't. And so a, a normal uh, rate is probably more between about 15 to 20 percent. I mean, that's roughly what you want to see. So I mean, we, would that be the case in, say, Japan or somewhere like that? I mean, yeah, no, exactly. Right. And that's what you saw in the United States uh, before this period of financialization. Uh, now, we're, we're not at that high level that we reached in that peak right before the, the big economic crash, but it tells you something about the general trajectory of the mm. U.S. economy and, and where money was flowing. It wasn't flowing to research and design and development of new products, that's for sure. I mean, it was just being recycled through Wall Street and these super profits were being generated that were not being invested in the productive sector. So, uh, you know, we, we really created a, a new economy, one which saw a uh, kind of permanent uh, stagnation uh, in terms of people's wages. Uh, we saw um, locations, as you referenced, where there was affluence, you know, typically the coast, so uh, the northeast of the country and, uh, and the west, while much of the interior of the uh, country really saw uh, you know, significant decline, which eventually you know, gave us this kind of political, uh, for lack of a better term, populism that we've seen in the past few years and the emergence of you know, the Tea Party and Donald Trump, uh, etc., uh, so if you take a look at the uh, uh, former industrial heartland of the country, you know, it's a place that's marked by an opioid crisis and uh, lots of, uh, uh, of poverty. And it was once the richest part uh, of, of the country. If I may mm -hmm. just pick up a couple of points uh, yeah. as you've gone through there. But thank you. That was, that was sure. a really fan fantastic summary, I think. And there's plenty to discuss there. Uh, first of all, this idea that uh, businesses, business was unwilling or unable to kind of reinvest in, in anything other than rolling over its loans and so on. Right. Um, was that not slightly changed in the you know, Silicon Valley dot-com bubble and everything? Because we talk endlessly about you know, innovation, investment, coming yeah. up, new technologies. Did that not, to some extent, replace the investment that was happening before in the corporate sector? Uh, I would say, no, overall, no. I mean, if we take a look at overall research uh, expenditures as a percentage of uh, GDP, again, uh, they, they have declined. That doesn't mean that there are not sectors where there's... Uh, um, you know, uh, research that is being funded. So, you know, we do see that again with IT to a certain extent. Uh, that's true. Uh, but it's... But it's what sort of self-contained rather than... Yeah, 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 to a certain extent. Uh, and, you know, I think we sometimes overstate the importance of IT. And, you know, we can understate it as well. Uh, so we don't want to do that. But, I mean, you know, Robert Gordon, the... Uh, um, economic historian at Northwestern University who in 2016 made Forbes's list of the top 50 most important Americans because of a book that he had published at that time in terms of you know, looking at what he thought as the end of American growth. Uh, you know, he suggested once quite simply that you know, if you had to choose between an indoor toilet and an iPhone, you were probably going to take the indoor toilet every time. 
You know, in other words, the, the big gains in terms of productivity uh, happened in the United States between about 1870 and 1970. And the ones that have happened since then have not been all that big. And the ones that we have had are still, uh, for the most part, based on technology that was developed um, in the 1960s for the space program. Mm. So, you know, with my computer here in front of me or with the IT uh, sector in Silicon Valley, you know, it's based on the uh, microprocessing chip, which uh, replaced, you know, so a computer chip, which is about as big as your thumbnail or, or smaller, uh, that, you know, used to uh, require computers that were as big as this room that we're in with a battery of air conditioners to keep them uh, uh uh, cooled, uh, but you know we had certain uh, needs, such as a space program. So we developed uh, technologies which uh, introduced um, these new productivity-enhancing uh, possibilities. Not really developed by the private sector on its own, but uh, by the state. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean that's where the uh, the big innovation came. Or even with a figure like Bill Gates. You know, I mean what he did, which is quite impressive. I mean, but uh, he took. A myriad of pieces of new technology that were lying about uh, all around him, and uh, he assembled them in, in new ways. But those pieces of technology were, in effect, I mean, developed um, which kind of had come out of the, the public sector. So yeah, 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 yeah. But mostly by the public sector, actually, right. by state spending uh, in our, our research universities because they really uh, have the capacity to you know, undertake the kind of um, long-term research programs that are required to produce anything that's really new these days. Well, the other thing I'd like mm -hmm. to pick up on and perhaps develop, uh, you mentioned that we've kind of reached a position in which the U.S. economy is uh, unbalanced or, well, I can't remember the exact word you used. It was like either vulnerable or something like mm -hmm. that. But the, the, the big... Contra argument that's always wheeled out to that mm -hmm. is, oh yeah, but we have the dollar, and that's like our yeah. guarantor right. of stability. Sure. I mean, is that false faith in the dollar? I mean, can anything get past it? Y well, uh, it's if true. you control it's, the world's it's, currency, it's, you it's, can kind it's, of it's true. rig the game, right? Right, right. Until it isn't, and we don't know when it's not going to be anymore. But yeah, that's essentially how the United States has. Uh, been able to go through this transformation over the past uh, half century without seeing too dramatic of a decline in living standards. Now, again, you have to look at the United States by location uh, to see where some of the big declines have happened. But the United States would have declined much further if it didn't have the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency. It's allowed us to uh, maintain really, really big government deficits. It's like no sweat, you know, because people need a place to, to park their money. Uh, especially oil producers, uh, oligarchs from the uh, former Soviet bloc, etc. And, you know, you do that in London and you do that in, in New York. Or if you're not going to go to their private banks, you, you buy uh, Washington's uh, treasury bills. I mean, that's the safest, uh, safest in investment uh, of all. And so as long as there are still buyers for that, and there still are, although, um, you know, I, I think that it's... Uh, possible to envision a day in which that uh, might no longer be the case, the, the United States can kind of continue to maintain the system of running really, really big uh, government uh, uh, deficits, and not deficits that build infrastructure or productivity enhancing um, uh, uh, new capacities in terms of you know, research universities, etc., but it's just to fund everyday expenditures in the military. Uh, uh, is included in that. So it's, um, uh, it's a model which has uh, allowed for relatively low taxation. Uh, so as you probably know, our top marginal income tax rates are just a fraction of what they used to be during the more ascendant or dominant period that the US uh, uh, represented in the immediate post-World War II uh, era. Uh, and you know, it's allowed us to buy lots of cheap stuff from abroad because but, the dollar is relatively strong. But then is mm -hmm. what's required Sorry to simplify mm -hmm. it to this yeah, extent, but something like mm -hmm. the uh, FDR approach, I mean, a, a, a more cohesive yeah. uh, government involved. I mean, there's, there's a great fear, it seems, particularly in the political sphere of anyone in the, any U.S. politician, except mm -hmm. perhaps Bernie Sanders, sort mm -hmm. of suggesting that the government should get involved a bit more in this or that, yeah. uh, even the opioid crisis. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think we need to look at the experience not only of the 1930s, but of World War II as well. I mean, the United States developed uh, really impressive 
organizational and planning capacities, uh, just as a, a necessity of operating this massively complex operation, you know, which was uh, World War II. We've lost those capacities, it's, it's clear. I mean, if you take a look at you know, the US response a bit more than a decade ago to Hurricane Katrina or to the COVID uh, crisis uh, more currently, we just can't do the simplest of stuff. Uh, and, and I think that represents that long-term erosion of uh, state capacities as we have uh, trimmed uh, uh, public budgets, you know, just you know, down to, to the bone. So I, I think that's highly problematic for the United States, both in terms of its ability to react to crises such as we've just seen with this public health uh, challenge, uh, but also to um, uh, build an economy that has a foundation which allows it to, to, to grow. So, uh, an F, you know, I mean, it's, it's nice as a rhetorical device, uh, but we would need something different. I mean, we couldn't just exactly reproduce uh, the, the New Deal, uh, but, you know, something like the Green New Deal, I don't think is a, a, a bad idea. Hmm. Uh, um, you know, we could make a, an energy sector, which is far more green, which employs lots of people, uh, and, you know, that arguably would be good for the country. Uh, to do something like that. Uh, um, but do you think perhaps, I mean, the, the examples you mm -hmm. mentioned, World War II, Hurricane mm -hmm. Katrina or whatever, yep. um, people see, when there's an external threat, people tend to bold, band together right. and they act as a kind of social glue in which the previous differences between them aren't quite as important because, you know. So might the mm -hmm. coronavirus crisis, I mean, anything short of a Martian invasion, which would probably do it, right. might that actually act as a, a, as a way of providing this glue? I mean, particularly given the, mm -hmm. you know, the clear example that, let's say, the response has been suboptimal, to put it mildly. Might yeah. this cause the sort of uh, rethinking that's required to create, as you say, the way that America used to be able to, the space program being a right. classic example, Organize the most incredibly complex, you know, social, political, economic uh, projects and achieve them seemingly with ease. Right. I mean, that's a really important question. And the answer is, I don't know. And I would say, unfortunately, probably not. You know, I'm thinking about uh, uh, Finland's uh, Cold War president, Kekwand, and he served, you know, for ages uh, in that office. And, uh, you know, he, he was fond of saying that... The, the Soviet Union created uh, the workers' paradise. And you know, then he would pause, and then he would say, just not in the Soviet Union, but in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, by that he meant, uh, because we had this big power right next to us, and it had done some unpleasant things to us, uh, it gave me the leverage uh, that I needed to discipline our business community and get them to act more in concert to uh, advance the development of the nation rather than just their, their own interests. And in the end, they ended up getting really, really rich anyway. Mm. So it actually worked to uh, uh, everyone's advantage. So yeah, the United States uh, certainly seems to need some kind of an external uh, threat, which it had in the 20th century, real or imagined. We can uh, argue to what extent it was. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it did give that push to the United States to uh, do uh, sometimes the right thing, or as, you know, Winston Churchill used to say, uh, the United States doing the right thing after exhausting all other options first. Uh, <laughs> but right now, we, we don't even seem to be at the point where uh, after exhausting all the other options, we do the right thing. So I mean, that's the disconcerting thing. I mean, since the 2008 crisis in particular. So yeah, we, we, we do uh, seem to uh, need some kind of um, But is that going to come threat. from political leadership or maybe from grassroots protests, which we haven't seen on such a scale it yeah, seems, in, in the U.S. Uh, for a very long time, right. uh, if ever. Uh, I understand you actually have sort of witnessed some of this at, at first hand. So, yeah. what was the, you know, what's the feeling? Is it just a case of is it a case of social injustice, uh, or is there an economic element to it too? Are people thinking of the economic element, or just, yeah. you know, we don't want to be treated like this? Right. Uh, so, thinking about a place like Kenosha, Wisconsin, a place that was kind of dominating the news cycle about a month ago in the United States, this town of about 1,000, 100,000 people that uh, you know, was dominated by the auto sector uh, at one time. It uh, uh, used to have about a, a population of some 10% that was African-American, but a full third of the auto workers 
were African American and they were getting really high union wages and so they were doing well. Well, that sector collapses uh, along with it, these high union wages and people just, you know, collapse into this poverty from which they, they really never recovered. Pair that uh, with um, young people of all ethnic backgrounds in the United States uh, who just have had almost no opportunity since the 2008 crisis. I mean, they are just really living on the margins. High paying jobs just don't exist really for that generation, you know, with some small exceptions for people going into IT, finance, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, so you have a, a really radicalized a white anarchist a community. Um, and I, I, I don't see these protests uh, potentially bringing anything like social cohesion. Uh, they certainly represent people who are very frustrated, I think very rightly so, but I don't see the protests actually achieving anything productive, uh, which is a concern of mine. You know, in, in referencing, you know, World War II and um, the experience of the country then, which was so different, uh, uh, we certainly don't want another world war, but, you know, the U.S. military, of course, at that time, you know, brought all these people from different backgrounds into, you know, a, a common shared experience in terms of, you know, the war, and people had an understanding of each other. And I think that helped uh, the country in terms of social cohesion, at mm -hmm. least for a generation. You know, but now uh, people are, are just in their own kind of uh, hermetically sealed environments, just completely cut off from other people in the country. They just don't have any understanding of uh, people who are not like them. And so it's a, it's a very... There have been really strong kind of centrifugal forces of the past half century pushing people apart. And so I think it, the, part of that is why we uh, are seeing these protests right now, in addition to that economic decline that I've, I've mentioned as well. I mean, do the, do the protests have like a stated aim or is it just like letting off yeah. steam? Okay. It's, a, it's a bit of both. I mean, uh, there are some uh, kind of vague references to... Uh, among some of them, you know, ending capitalism, you know, whatever that is, I still can't define capitalism, frankly. It's a, it's a complicated uh, topic. And, and then I, you have the problem they, of coming up with something to replace it. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think they, you know, they, they just, we really don't have an understanding. There's a lot of identity politics, uh, and so... Uh, but that's uh, all reactive, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, very, it's, very it's much not, so. Uh, we want to move towards this. It's, right. We want to move away from that. Yeah, I think, I think what happened, I mean, if you take a look at the United States in terms of the development of its... Uh, politics over the past four years. In 2016, we saw this very impressive performance by Bernie Sanders. And because of his age, he's old, um, he has kind of an understanding of political economy, actually. And so he was talking about, uh, you know, rebuilding uh, the country's infrastructure, both human and physical. And this was something that young people got really excited about. But when his campaign did not succeed, and that it did not succeed again, uh, this time around, uh, many of his supporters have said, okay, we're done with that, and we're going, we're, we're be as they say now, we're beyond Bernie. And now they have uh, this more, I don't want to call it radical, uh, because, it, because it, it doesn't really, to my mind, uh, build anything that's transformative, but let's just say a more strongly oppositional mm. uh, political culture. They're just against the system, whatever the system is. So there's a lot of uh, hostility among young people to um, the system as it exists in the United States right now. But that does suggest that if you know, a figure or a movement came along that was able to harness this energy which is mm -hmm. out there, which is, feels dispossessed, then it could potentially be quite powerful or could, could start to make an impact on the political world. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think, I think unfortunately that moment passed in 2016 and now we're in a trickier period. Uh, people are talking about more and more the necessity of violence uh, as a transformative agent. I mean, it, it, we're getting into some pretty dangerous So we're getting back to the, the Black United Hand States. Gang kind of... Uh... <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the language is, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tough right now. And, well, before we wrap up, because we're just about at the end, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have extensive experience here. Mm -hmm. Usually, here in the Baltics, we're asking what can we learn from you know, America? What can we learn from the West? Given your 
lengthy tenure here and your ability to see both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, is there anything now that you think America could learn from this part of the world in terms of the political discourse mm-hmm. or the you know, economic uh, arrange, arrangements or social cohesion? Yeah. I mean, because o- often Latvia in particular is kind of pilloried for, uh, on social issues, mm-hmm. cohesion issues, but maybe it's not been quite as bad, comparatively speaking, as we were led to believe by the great shining yeah, beacon of liberty. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, Latvia is a place which is far more socially cohesive than the United States right now and has been actually for, for quite some time. I mean, it's not that there are not problems here. We know what uh, some of those issues are. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just overall on balance, a calmer place, which is, is a good thing. <laughs> uh, and and um, yeah, I think uh, you know you saw a good deal of cooperation from the public during the the COVID crisis in the spring. Uh, so you know you didn't have the kinds of reactions that you saw uh, from many in the United States or in Germany, by the way, as well. Where we're seeing these increasing protests against these you know, restrictions on movement and uh, requirements to wear face masks, etc. So yeah, I think I think. Um, I think socially, uh, the environment here is actually good now. I mean, st- there are still some really big problems here in terms of inequality. Uh, you know, and despite some of the advances that have been made in checking the offshore banking sector, uh, you know, there's still nonsense going on there. I think we all know. That. I mean, they find new ways of actually just continuing uh, that game by uh, other means. Uh, I don't think there's as much infrastructure spending as uh, there should be, which is the, the key to uh, developing new wealth. Uh, yeah, and you know, just old complaints of mine about the financial you know, system here being too large, et cetera. So. And if we might finish off by kind of coming full circle, mm-hmm. we began with neoliberalism, and I was reading some of your old, old papers, actually, and you stated definitively that neoliberalism had failed. Mm-hmm. So do you still maintain that neoliberalism, neoliberalism has failed? I mean, yeah. maybe not just in, in the Baltics, or is there still some vestige of it you know, lingering in the political system in the way... Oh, no, it's still, it's still unfortunately dominant. Right. You know, and, and um, where the neoliberal revolution... Uh, really was uh, at its strongest was in Frankfurt. You know, it's it's among economic policymakers in the EU. So they're you know they're trying to reconcile this contradiction between uh, uh, the social Europe model that they have and uh, this adherence to a, a neoliberal uh, economic uh, um, uh, model, which doesn't allow for the effective deployment of capital, to my mind, for investing in infrastructure, etc. You know, it's created all sorts of imbalances. I mean, Germany gets, you know, this free ride in terms of an undervalued currency, while the Italians and the French uh, and a few others get absolutely killed as their currency that they have to use is overvalued. Uh, and then the Germans try and square all of this by, you know, uh, having structural funds which uh, sustain demand in these countries but don't necessarily lead to development. And we know what the problems are here. I mean, you know, uh, you've lost huge numbers of people. I mean, it's, it's not as if this has come without uh, uh, social costs. I mean, so many people were left immiserated by uh, these processes that they left in the, the hundreds of thousands. I mean, that is not a small thing for a country this size. And so, uh, you know, the, the very demographic future of the country is uh, at, at stake as a consequence. So uh, I, I, think, I think it's been a very costly model. Well, Jeffrey, we've reached the end, sadly. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Happy to be here. But as we've been going along, I've been mm-hmm. taking notes, and I've realized that we've got at least another four podcasts to do with you in the future. So I think we'll start off all new yeah. series of, uh, of our podcasts in the future with one from you. So Great. thank you for joining me. I'll be here another two and a half months. <laughs> thank you for listening. This podcast was produced by SSC Riga. If you'd like to learn more about the topic, visit the open course schedule at SSC Riga Executive Education. For more podcasts, find us on Spotify, iTunes, or the platform of your choice. Remember, share this episode with your friends and colleagues.